Welcome to another video. As you can obviously tell by the title, I'll be talking about Cyberpunk 2077. However, it's not just Cyberpunk 2077 that I'm going to be talking about. I'll also be talking about the show Cyberpunk Edge Runners, and sometimes I'll throw in some weird lore or trivia from the world of Cyberpunk, like from the pen and paper RPGs, the novels, etc. If you end up enjoying the video, leave a like and comment. And if you want more Iceberg videos, subscribe to the channel, because I've got a lot more Icebergs planned out. And I've already got plenty out already. Topics like Marvel, Star Wars, Mass Effect, Evangelion, Halo, Godzilla, DC, Cowboy Bebop, Battlefield, etc. I'm sure I've made a video that interests you. Now with all that out of the way, let's get on to the Iceberg. The Disastrous Launch while Cyberpunk 2077 is pretty stable nowadays, it can't be forgotten that Cyberpunk's launch might have been the single worst video game launch ever. The game was filled to the brim with glitches and bugs. And I'm not just talking about minor stuff, although that was definitely there too, I'm talking about game-breaking bugs. The game was extremely unstable and crashed constantly. It got so bad that PlayStation removed the game from its store only weeks after the game's launch. They even offered refunds to people who bought the game digitally. CD Projekt Red then came out and apologized for the horrible launch and offered refunds. Microsoft would later offer refunds for those who purchased the game digitally as well, though they kept the game in the store. Though, to this day, if you go and try to buy the Xbox One port of 2077, you'll be met with a warning saying that the game performs horribly. But it keeps getting worse. Because of the state the game was released in, CD Projekt Red was accused of misrepresenting the game during marketing. This led to a class action lawsuit being filed against the company in December of 2020. And in January of 2021, another class action lawsuit was filed against them. And by May of 2021, CD Projekt Red was involved in four different lawsuits. These lawsuits would merge into just one common action, and CD Projekt Red eventually paid $1.85 million to its investors as part of the lawsuit's terms. But it gets even worse. Because of the launch, CD Projekt Red was investigated by Poland's Office of Competition and Consumer Protection. But don't worry, it gets even worse. You see, when the game launched, it didn't have any warnings related to the various flashing lights in the game. Flashing lights that, in-universe, were meant to trigger seizures. But it didn't just trigger in-game seizures, but also real-life ones. For example, Leanna Rupert, who was reviewing the game for Game Informer, experienced a grand mal seizure. CD Projekt Red would then add in a warning in December of 2020 to warn about the flashing lights. Because of all of this, Cyberpunk 2077 was labeled one of the worst games ever made. Not because of its story or anything like that. It was called that because you literally couldn't play the game. Luckily, as time's gone by, updates and patches have been released that have fixed the game. It's still not perfect, but it actually runs pretty well now, at least on the Xbox Series XS, PS5, and PC. As for the PS4 and Xbox One ports, apparently they do run, like, solidly now, but not great. Franchised before 2077. So a decent amount of people to this day don't know that Cyberpunk 2077 wasn't some new IP thought up by CD Projekt Red. Instead, Cyberpunk 2077 is the first major video game outing in an already established franchise created by Mike Pondsmith. The franchise began in 1988 with Cyberpunk 2013, a pen and paper RPG heavily inspired by authors Philip K. Dick and William Gibson, alongside the film Blade Runner. And due to its popularity, it got various new editions and source books. The new editions include Cyberpunk 2020, Cyberpunk version 3.0, which I'll talk about a bit more later, and Cyberpunk Red. Some of the various source books include Edge Runners Inc., Deep Space, Live and Direct, Near Orbit, Rocker Boy, 
Black Chrome, Data Screen, Home of the Brave, and Rough Guide to the UK. There's also been various adventure books released, like When the Chips Are Down, Night City Stories, Chasing the Dragon, Cabin Fever, Firestorm, Land of the Free, Street Fighting, and the Osiris Chip. Not only that, but there's been two different collectible card games released, one in 1996 and the second in 2003. So no, Cyberpunk 2077 is far from the first installment of the franchise. The General Lee At first glance, the Quadra Type 66 Gen Rowley is just another car in the game you can buy and drive around in. However, it's actually a reference to the TV series The Dukes of Hazard, as not only does the car look similar to the famous General Lee featured in the show, but the name of the car is a direct reference to the show, with the name Gen Rowley being a joke about how people with heavy southern accents say General Lee. Furthermore, the car has a Southern California license plate, referencing how most of Dukes of Hazzard was filmed in Thousand Oaks, California. The Secret Ending So Cyberpunk 2077 has multiple endings. Most people know about the Avengers Endgame Yourself ending, the Devil ending, the Star ending, the Temperance ending, and the Sun ending. But there's actually a secret ending. If you get Johnny's affinity over 70% and wait 5 minutes when given the chance to contact Rogue or Pan Am, a secret option will pop up. This is the secret ending, in which V and Johnny decide to storm Arasaka Tower themselves without any help. However, this is extremely difficult, as if you die, you'll be sent back to your last save. There's no checkpoints during this ending, so you'll have to go all the way back to the points in the game where you and Johnny decide what to do about Arasaka Tower. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. The game autosaves at two points during the mission. The first is after descending to the mainframe level, and the second is right before the Atom Smasher fight. So if you know about these, you can actually go back to these autosaves instead of your last manual save. This secret ending eventually leads to a variation of the Sun ending, Skippy. So Skippy, the AI-powered pistol, is a pretty weird weapon. Because, well... Bum, bum, be dum, bum, bum, be <laughs> what, dum, what are you doing? Bum. You can find Skippy lying next to a dead body in Vista del Rey, and if you use him to kill around 50 enemies, he'll turn into a non-lethal gun, switching to his puppy-loving pacifist mode. Skippy also loves to act out. Sometimes when you're holding him and doing some stealth, he'll just start blasting away. Sometimes when you're just walking around with him, he'll aim down the sights, causing everyone around you to panic. Eventually, you're given the chance to turn Skippy over to Regina, who was actually Skippy's second owner, as she won him during a poker game. And once you hand Skippy over to her, she kills it. She resets Skippy, which erases its memories and personality. Normally, I'd be against it, but Skippy was really annoying, so I don't really care. Most players know about Skippy, but not everyone knows that Skippy is actually a reference to Skippy the Magnificent, an AI featured in the novel series Expeditionary Force by Craig Allison. Rebecca's Design Controversy So Rebecca had some controversy surrounding her. Not from fans of the show, but instead CD Projekt Red. During the development of Edge Runners, CD Projekt Red were a bit worried about Rebecca's design, and they asked Studio Trigger to redesign her. Studio Trigger responded with, no. So a member of CD Projekt Red suggested they vote for her removal from the show. But again, Studio Trigger said, no. And so, Rebecca was left unchanged. Three seashells. When inside V's apartment, the default one, if you go into the bathroom, you'll find three seashells next to the toilet. This is an easter egg referencing the film Demolition Man. As in that film, in the future, toilet paper has been replaced with three seashells. So how would you use these three seashells to clean up after yourself after using the bathroom? Nobody knows. They never explain it in the film. And honestly, I don't really want to think about people using seashells to clean up poop. As for the cyberpunk universe, there is actually toilet paper. 
but I guess V's just a weirdo who wants to wipe their butt with seashells. River Ward's Awful Hospital Photo So after saving River's nephew Randy from the world's worst farm, you'll eventually be sent a photo of Randy recovering in the hospital, surrounded by his family. And it is one of the most poorly created things in a AAA video game. Where do I even begin? So we got River, who's staring at the wall, not the camera. You got Randy, who's obviously sitting down in a chair, but you can't see that because they covered him up in a blanket. Although his legs don't match where his, like, body is. Then we got a little girl holding a real-life teddy bear PNG. And finally, we got River's sister staring blankly at the camera. In fact, outside of the little girl, nobody in the photo is smiling. Nobody looks happy that Randy's okay. If you play the game on PC, you can actually download a mod that replaces the image. Although personally, I don't know why you'd want to because this is the funniest. <laughs> when I got to this part in the game and I saw this for the first time, I laughed for like 10 minutes straight. It was the funniest damn thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, just an update, uh, the 2.0 update just came out and they changed River's image. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm conflicted about this because like, yeah, this is much better, but that that photo was magical that was like one of the worst images in any video game ever if not the worst i i, I really i really wish this was like the one thing they never changed rebecca's shotgun despite wanting her design to be changed cd project red decided to throw in an easter egg relating to rebecca in 2077 though not at the launch of the game because you know the show wasn't out yet it was added in the edge runners content dlc which was a free content update released on September 6th, 2022. After this update, in Memorial Park, you can find Rebecca's shotgun, Guts, in some bushes. Don't worry about taking it though, I'm sure she doesn't need it anymore. Guts has 8 shells in it, fires pretty slowly, and has insane recoil. So at first glance, doesn't seem very useful, but it's also extremely devastating. I actually used Guts throughout my entire playthrough of the game. And yes, I killed Adam Smasher with it. Akira Bike The Yeba Kusanagi CT3X is a motorcycle you can acquire in the game and is a direct reference to the manga and the far more famous anime film, Akira. And I guess that upcoming anime reboot that I'm pretty sure will never actually come out. Much like Gunbuster 3. <laughs> Seriously, it's just, it's not gonna happen, I'm sorry. The motorcycle is very clearly designed after the iconic motorcycle featured in the franchise. You can even see the pill capsule featured on Kanita's jacket in Akira on the bike. But this bike is actually a double reference, because Akira isn't the only thing this bike references. It's also a reference to the Ghost in the Shell franchise, as the name of the bike is a reference to Major Motoko Kusanagi, who is the main protagonist in pretty much every Ghost in the Shell media, except for the second film. Although she's still in it. Ages of the Edge Runners characters. While never mentioned in the show, Cyberpunk Edge Runners showrunner revealed most of the main cast's ages on Reddit. It turns out that David, at the very beginning of the show, is 17, but after the time jump, he's 18. Meanwhile, Lucy and Rebecca were both 20 when the show began, and both presumably turned 21 when the time skip happens. And finally, Maine, Dorio, and Pillar were all in their late 30s when the show began. As for Falco and Kiwi, I have uh, no idea. They didn't say. If I had to guess, Kiwi's like early 30s, and uh, let's say Falco's like 98 years old. You can't prove me wrong. Cyberpunk 2020 exists inside Cyberpunk. So as I mentioned before, the Cyberpunk franchise started out as a pen and paper RPG called Cyberpunk 2020. But what I didn't mention is that Cyberpunk 2020 exists inside of the Cyberpunk universe. As you can find a shard in 2077 called Cyberpunk 2020 Rulebook. You can find the Cyberpunk 2020 Rulebook shard in a basement during the gig The Heisenberg Principle. Side note that Gig's name is an obvious reference to Breaking Bad. David's Jacket Like with Rebecca's shotgun, Guts, David Martinez's jacket was added into 2077 via the Edge Runner content DLC update. 
Unlike Rebecca's shotgun, you can't just find it lying around in the open. In order for you to get the jacket, you gotta do the side job over the edge, which starts in Mega Building H4. This mission is rather unique, because you can actually interact with a character from the show. That being Falco, who will eventually send you a package containing David's jacket. As for its stats, it's nothing crazy. It's more of just like a nice little easter egg, than something that you're gonna main in the game. Cancelled Multiplayer Mode Before the release of the game, CD Projekt Red announced that eventually, Cyberpunk 2077 would receive a DLC that would allow players to play multiplayer in Night City. Fans were pretty hyped, despite not knowing whether or not this online mode would be a PvP experience or a co-op one. Sadly, plans for this multiplayer DLC were scrapped pretty quickly after the release of the game. Because, as I've talked about, the game had one of the worst launches ever. And so, all hands had to be on deck to fix the game, and get the Xbox Series XS, PC, and PS5 versions of the game ready for release. So, this multiplayer mode was cancelled. Hopefully a future Cyberpunk game will feature some kind of online mode, or maybe an online-only spin-off. Who knows? Anything's possible. The Various Witcher Easter Eggs So because Cyberpunk 2077 was made by CD Projekt Red, there's a bunch of references to the Witcher franchise. And by Witcher franchise, I mean the Witcher games. Because CD Projekt Red makes them. They did not make the Netflix shows, or the obscure 2002 Polish series, or the original novels, of course. So here's some of the Easter Eggs. The most obvious one is an arcade game titled Roach Race, which has you playing as the horse, Roach, from the Witcher series. In the game, you play as Roach, dodging various obstacles. The image, used in the offensive defense perk, is based on series card art featured in Gwent, the card game spin-off to The Witcher. The car, the Rayfield Arendite, Guinevere, is named after the sword, Arendite featured in the Witcher series. The shovel, the caretaker's spade, is a direct reference to the shovel the same name you could find to the Witcher 3's Hearts of Stone expansion. And finally, you can find a retro gaming magazine that features the Witcher 3 on it, meaning that the Witcher game series exists inside the cyberpunk universe. Unused Areas one of the most well-known pieces of cut content in Cyberpunk 2077 is actually multiple pieces of cut content that you can actually find in-game. These are unused areas, places that were very clearly meant for the player to explore at one point in the game's development, but for one reason or another were scrapped. Here's some examples. There's the Arasaka Rocket Pad. At first glance, it looks like just a background building out of bounds, but if you no-clip towards it, it's weirdly detailed in a lot of areas, suggesting that at one point in the game's development, you were able to explore the area. Then there's the resort, which you can actually see on the map, but it's impossible for you to actually go there unless you no-clip. And like with the rocket pad, the resort is weirdly detailed in a lot of areas suggesting that you were supposed to be able to go here at some point in the game. There's also a completely finished marketplace inside of V's mega building that goes unused. It's got NPCs, lootable items, etc. The NPCs there even have pathfinding. And finally, in mega building 8, there's a completely functional elevator that's out of bounds. If you no clip over to it, you can make it go up or down to the locations on its keypad. However, these locations don't actually exist. Childhood Heroes During the development of Cyberpunk 2077, there was a system planned called Childhood Heroes. This was going to be an option at the very beginning of the game in the Character Creator section, where you could choose who V's childhood hero was. These options were Johnny Silverhand, Morgan Blackhand, and Saburo Arasaka. Depending on your answer, V would have different interactions with certain characters. This system was removed from the game and replaced with the origin options. 
Street Kid, Corpo, and Nomad. The Various Matrix Easter Eggs so because Cyberpunk 2077 is a cyberpunk video game that stars Keanu Reeves, of course there's going to be plenty of references and easter eggs to the Matrix franchise, which are cyberpunk films starring Keanu Reeves. So here's most of them. There's an archived conversation called John Anderson and Orpheus that's a direct reference to the scene from the first Matrix film where Morpheus warns Neo about the Hugo Weaving people coming after him. In the mission, Never Fade Away, Johnny Silverhand, played by Keanu Reeves, is called Mr. Silverhand by a man in a suit. This is an obvious reference to how in the Matrix films, Agent Smith refers to Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, as Mr. Anderson. During the ending sequence where V connects to Mikashi, V sees the same cat twice. Another obvious reference to the scene in The Matrix, where Neo sees a cat running past a doorway twice. In the secret ending to the game, the way the mission begins is extremely similar to the lobby shootout scene from the original Matrix. During the chippin' in side mission, the player is offered a choice between a red pill and a blue pill. I shouldn't have to explain this one, but yeah, this is the most obvious reference to The Matrix. The last one I'll mention is the image used in the perk, Pain is an Illusion. This image is a reference to the original Matrix film, notably the scene in which Neo stops some bullets. Mix it up controversy. Before the release of Cyberpunk 2077, there was a bit of controversy surrounding an in-game advertisement for an in-universe soda called Chrono Manticore, with the ad's tagline being, Mix it up. Normally, this wouldn't be anything controversial, but the character in the ad is transgender, with a very noticeable bulge. This made the ad come across as fetishizing trans people. This led to many people accusing the game as transphobic, or at the very least, this ad. In response to this, Cyberpunk 2077's art director, Kaisa Radijic, said that in-universe, corporations are using this model for their body, the fact that they're being displayed like this is bad. It's commentary on the hypersexualized ads we see in the real world, and that we, as V, in the game, would be fighting back against corporations who do this kind of stuff. Regardless how you feel about this controversy, trans rights are human rights, obviously, and uh, trans people are pretty based. If you disagree, go cry about it. Project Orion. On October 4th, 2022, CD Projekt Red announced that a sequel to Cyberpunk 2077 was in development. The game, codenamed Project Orion, will be developed primarily by CD Projekt Red members working in Boston, Massachusetts, though they will be helped by the teams working in Warsaw, Poland, and Vancouver, Canada. And that's literally all we know about the game. Don't expect this game until, like, the end of the decade. Create a car to conquer the wind. A car that lets you slip off the commonplace and experience driving excitement as never before. The Pontiac Firebird Trans Am. Sit here and learn firsthand how Firebird conquers the wind and the world. Pontiac. We build excitement. HK13. During the job of Full Discourse, if you crack the security to Sandra Dorset's databank shard, you'll find a reference to the Star Wars franchise. The Shard references a robot known as HK-13, who's showing psychopathic behavior. What kind of psychopathic behavior? Well, attempted murder. Yeah, it attempted to strangle a scientist to death before escaping the research facility it was housed in. HK-13 is a reference to the hunter-killer assassin droids featured throughout the Star Wars franchise. Notably, HK-47, who is a major character in various Star Wars video games. Misty and Pris. Misty is a bit of an interesting character. 
not just because of her contributions to the story and her character, but also because her design is actually a homage to the Blade Runner character, Pris. A franchise that, as I mentioned before, directly inspired the creation of the cyberpunk franchise. Hideo Kojima cameo. During the gig, The Heist, if you head over to the hotel's bar, you can find acclaimed video game director and game designer, Hideo Kojima, chilling out discussing his latest project, something that he's having a bit of trouble with due to the limitations of brain dances. Although, this actually isn't Kojima in-universe. Instead, this guy is named Oshima, but he is voiced by Kojima. そうじゃないんじゃないかな。だから今東京のチームと実験をしてるんだよ。人間の感情がもっと豊かな作品を作ろうと思ってね。例えば嬉しいけど物悲しいとか落ち着いてるけど何か不安を感じるとかそういう感
because his model actually has a, a completely textured face. You can see in game via a graphical glitch. So yeah, there he is. Melissa Rory. In 2013, Cyberpunk 2077 was announced to the public with a teaser trailer. And in this teaser trailer, you see a cyber psycho with mantis blades chilling out on the ground after murdering a bunch of people. The trailer then jumps forward in time, and now she's a cop. It's a pretty memorable teaser trailer, so it's no surprise that it's referenced in the final game. However, it's not the reference you'd probably expect. Instead of this woman being one of the cyber psychos you take down, this woman, who's named Melissa Rory, appears in the game as a max tech officer. It turns out, after the cyber psycho incident, she was taken in alive by max tech for some reason and reconditioned. But with a cost, she had to join max tech. She was confirmed to be the same woman in the teaser trailer in the job Bullets where V can ask her about her mantis blades, and she's like, yeah, I keep these as a reminder of what I did. I killed like 14 people, and was forced to join the police instead of being killed. My life's pretty crazy. Hey, wanna join Max Tac? Another fun fact about her is that her blades are the model Hiragashi 2013, which is an obvious reference to when the first teaser trailer for the game came out in 2013. The Bozos. In the world of cyberpunk, there's various gangs roaming Night City, and some of these gangs are weirder than others. Take for instance, the Bozos. The Bozos are a gang that terrorized Night City from the 2020s all the way to the late 2040s. They originally were just people who looked like clowns who would just prank people, so nobody really took them that seriously. That was until the Bozos decided to start killing people. It eventually got to the point where about a third of their entire group were cyber psychos. And one of their favorite things to do was to go around, kidnap people, and then torture them using that person's biggest fears and anxieties. For example, they would trap people in small spaces with rats, and trap people in elevators and then fill them with water. Sometimes they wouldn't even kill people, but instead just drive them insane. Oh yeah, and how could I forget to mention, the Bozos aren't dressed like clowns. They had their bodies bio-sculpted to look like clowns, giving themselves long feet and permanent frowns. So how come we don't see Bozos in Night City in 2077? Well, it's because in the 2040s, the group fell apart after a clown civil war. In 2045, some people pretending to be part of the Bozos began murdering people, which led to various hitmen hunting down the Bozos. In order to get these hitmen to stop killing the Bozos, the Bozos outed the group of fake Bozos. A lot of Bozos. This group was led by a dude named Big Top, who then decided to take over the Bozos. This led to the Bozos fragmenting into smaller Bozo factions that basically killed each other off while fighting for power. And so, by the time of 2077, the group was pretty much eradicated. And before you ask about Ozop Bozo, I'll talk about him a bit later. You guys remember in 2016 when a bunch of clowns started showing up randomly scaring people? Maybe the Bozos are real. Acid Rain Acid Rain is one of the most rare occurrences in the entire game. It's so rare that when the game first released, people thought it was actually cut from the game. But no, Acid Rain does exist in Night City. It's just extremely rare. However, it doesn't burn the player even if you're walking around without any clothes on, which is a bit of a bummer in my opinion. Jackie was originally an antagonist. In some very early drafts of Cyberpunk 2077's plotline, Jackie was going to become an antagonist. He'd still be cool with V for the most part, until the heist mission, where he would end up being the reason the heist goes wrong. This would lead to him turning on V, and the two would have to fight to the death. This was revealed in a stream with various CD Projekt Red developers. Mike Pondsmith cameo. So this is probably my favorite easter egg in the entire game, 
The conspiracy theorist DJ, Maximum Mike, is actually voiced by the creator of the cyberpunk franchise, Mike Pondsmith. And every single conspiracy theory he lists off on the radio are actually plot lines from various cyberpunk source books and adventure books. Now, does this mean the conspiracy theories he's throwing out there are legit? Well, I'd argue there's a good chance there's some truth to at least some of them. Here's an example of one of his many theories. So listen up, people. I've got a story to tell you. I heard something recently from a nomad friend of mine. She was telling me about some strange stuff happening out in the Badlands of the East. She said she ran across another nomad patrol. Five people, all mauled to death by a wild animal. But the thing is, folks, there haven't been mountain lions out there in almost a century, wolves and even longer. So what could it be? Well, I'm reminded of a story. A story told me by an old merc I used to know. He once took a job that had him fly over to Romania, looking for some Corpo's missing brother. Search took him to an old village, and they decided to camp for the night before searching the woods in the morning. That night, they could hear barking, howls in the distance. Even though they knew it had to be wild dogs, the team could barely get any sleep that night. Then, just before dawn, they were attacked by animals. But they weren't dogs. They were werewolves. No, no, listeners, I haven't lost it. I mean it. They were werewolves. But not the ones of legend and not the ones in old Hollywood flat-screen flicks. These bad doggies came out of a lab. See, it turns out that EBM had decided to back some rather unsavory sorts in an attempted coup of the government and offer these gene freaks as part of the deal. Of course, it didn't work. The coup was crushed a few months later, and EBM isn't around anymore either. The question remains, where did EBM get their knockoff wolfmen? They never had much of a gene hacking division, so they must have come from some other corp. The obvious answer, of course, is Biotechnica, who just happened to own most of the land south of Night City, all the way down to the border. So what do you think, listeners? Is Biotechnica releasing experimental monsters in the Badland? Maybe those protein farms down there are covered. Something broke out of a lab with a taste for human blood. It's always good advice to watch your back. But this time, you might want to pack a few silver bullets next time you leave town. Just say it. No Life 3 In 2077, you could find various references to a video game called No Life 3. You can find a poster for it in V's apartment, and you can find a shard called No Life 3 Review. This is a not-so-subtle reference to the cancelled video game Half-Life 3, a game that everyone and their mother wants to happen, even if you're not a fan of the series. Side note, there's another Half-Life easter egg in the game, as the crowbar's description references how it's the favorite weapon of theoretical physicists from MIT. This is a reference to how the protagonist of Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2, Gordon Freeman's main weapon is the crowbar. V's Original Origins So the Childhood Heroes system wasn't the only scrapped bit of V's backstory. In the same build of 2077, after you choose your childhood hero, you'd be given two more choices. The first was a key life event. These included V running away from home, V's first kill, or the death of V's sibling. The second choice was why V came to Night City, the options here being visiting an ex-lover, unfinished business, or something to prove. Just like with the childhood hero's choice, all of these were replaced with the life path system. Original Edgerunner Designs so David and Lucy went through various different design changes. A lot of David's early designs had him wearing a hoodie, along with very short hair. One design for the character didn't even include the now iconic yellow jacket, instead wearing a blue jacket. There was also a design where he'd be wearing a beanie throughout the show. The last design I'll mention for David is this one, from the show's teaser poster. While David looks similar to his final appearance, you can tell his head is very different. 
having completely different hair. Now, while most of David's designs all look relatively like him, Lucy's early designs were pretty wild. Some of her designs looked like they came straight at a kill to kill. There's this design, which gave her pink hair, and a suit that reminds me of Combat Evolved Cortana. There's also these designs, which gave her a ton of straps, and I think headphones. There's even a design where Lucy's wearing pants, which uh, sounds weird now that I say that out loud. Finally, there's these designs, which gave her jacket a lot more edges. She would also have some kind of gadget on her arm. And finally, there's Rebecca. And uh, her design never really changed all that much. The most notable change is her neck, with early designs having her either having a neck tattoo of some kind of rabbit or a necklace of a rabbit. Also, her thigh tattoo has a completely different design. Judy and Pan Am were originally bi. In the files of Cyberpunk 2077, people have found some pretty strange unused voice lines. Some of these voice lines were the entirety of Pan Am and Judy's romance storylines, but with different Vs. So there's audio of female V romancing Pan Am, and male V romancing Judy. This has led to various people to speculate that originally Pan Am and Judy were bisexual during the game's development, and were changed very close to the game's release. So, is this true? Well, no. It was confirmed by CD Projekt Red that Judy was always written to be a lesbian, and that they only recorded the male V's romance with her for posterity's sake. This was further confirmed by Gavin Drea, male V's voice actor, who said in an interview that while he was recording the lines for Judy's missions, all of the romantic lines were tagged as female V only, but the staff recording the audio decided to record them regardless. All of this is the same for Pan Am. You see, in games where you can choose the voice actor for the main character, it's fairly common for companies to have all potential voice actors the players can choose record lines that are supposed to be exclusive to one voice actor, just in case the game's studio changes something within the game. So long story short, Judy was always intended to be a lesbian, and Pan Am was always intended to be straight. Third Person Cutscenes For a lot of Cyberpunk 2077's development, the game was played in third person. However, during development, it was decided to make the game a first person RPG with some third person cutscenes. This was announced to players before release. However, by mid 2019, it was confirmed that third person cutscenes were fully removed from the game. This was done in order to create total immersion within the game. This annoyed a lot of fans, and to this day, there's a good chunk of fans who wish the game kept its third-person cutscenes. Luckily for PC players, there are mods that bring this cut feature back. Hardwired Hardwired is a cyberpunk novel released in 1986 and written by Walter John Williams. It also received two sequels, Voice of the Whirlwind in 1987 and Solip System in 1989. At first glance, this novel has nothing to do with the Cyberpunk franchise, as it was released before Cyberpunk 2013. So why am I talking about it? Well, it's because Hardwired was directly tied to the Cyberpunk franchise with the release of the Hardwired Sourcebook which, as you can see by the cover, has cyberpunk branding. So what's the deal with this? Well, this source book was written by both Walter John Williams and Mike Pondsmith, with the idea being that while the hardwired and cyberpunk universes are similar, they're not actually canon to each other. But you're advised to use the rules created for Cyberpunk 2013 with the source book. Basically, it's a pen and paper RPG sourcebook for the Hardwired trilogy with Cyberpunk's rule set. Kinda confusing, but that's the gist of it. Developer's Room In North Kabuki Market, there's a garage door you can find that can be opened using a keypad. However, unlike most doors in the game, you can't hack into this one, 
In order to open this door, you gotta enter a code. That code being 605185. This will open up the garage door and reveal a secret easter egg room, a tribute to the developers of the game. Inside, there's pictures of various dev team members that will appear on a TV screen, all while Johnny will appear and begin to play some music with his guitar. Blue Moon Romance After saving Blue Moon from her stalker in the mission Every Breath You Take, she'll contact V a few days later and offer to meet up with V if they're ever in Tokyo. And V can actually flirt with her and ask her out. She'll respond saying that while she'd love to go out on a date with V, she has to go on tour tomorrow so she doesn't have the time. This tiny little interaction has led to some people to speculate that a Blue Moon romance was in the cards at one point during Cyberpunk 2077's development, and that this is just a remnant of what could have been the beginning of that relationship. There's not really a lot of evidence for this theory, though. Some have argued that instead of a full-fledged romance, this was supposed to be the beginning of a one-off fling they cut from the game, similar to how you can have a one-night stand with Meredith Stout, especially since that encounter is triggered by a text message. But again, there's not really any evidence for this. German YouTubers so the mission Dirty Biz is easily one of the darkest jobs in the game, with V confronting a pair of brain dance editors who produce brain dances of murders, specializing in the murders of children. These editors are a father and son duo, with Gottfried being the dad and Frederick being the son. But there's actually a strange easter egg with the pair that you can only experience if you play the German dub of the game. You see, in the German dub of Cyberpunk 2077, these two are voiced by German YouTubers, with Gottfried being voiced by Gronk, and Frederick being voiced by Hand of Blood, Jackie's sister. Originally, Jackie was meant to have a sister named Melissa. However, she wouldn't be around chilling at the bar with the V and company. Instead, she would be missing. We know about this scrapped character because there's lines in the game's code that show that V was originally going to tell Jackie that either he or the both of them would find Melissa. This would be at the very end of the heist job, so uh, Jackie wouldn't be doing any searching. R.I.P. However, she was going to appear in the game. During Jackie's ofrenda, Melissa would show up and V would be able to talk to her. And as far as we know, this was going to be her only appearance in the game. Archangel In Cyberpunk 2077, you can listen to various songs created by Samurai. One song is pretty unique, that being Archangel. You see, this song, like all the others, was created for the game. However, unlike all the others, it wasn't actually in the game. I mean, parts of it were in the game, notably in the mission Never Fade Away, but it was only parts of the song. The full version, without in-game audio, wasn't in the game for some reason. It wasn't even released online. That was until the 1.5 patch for the game came out, as that patch added in the song. And around the same time, CD Projekt Red released the song online. No explanation has ever been given as to why this song wasn't included at launch. Subway and Monorail Systems Originally, Night City was going to have a fully functional subway system and a fully functional monorail system, similar to the train from Watch Dogs, GTA V, and both Red Dead Redemptions, the train and monorail would have allowed players to board them and travel around the city in real time. These were both shown off in several pre-release promotional images and videos. Sadly, they were cut from the game very late in development, as you can actually find nearly completed train stations all across Night City. You can access these areas by either glitching or using Noclip. You can even find the tram that would have been on the monorail by no-clipping into the tunnel by North Oak. 
After doing that and waiting around for a little bit, the tram will spawn in for some reason and go through its route. I should mention this though, as far as I know, you could only do this in 2020 and 2021, as I'm fairly certain by this point, this tram has been patched out of the game by 2023. If you really want to ride the cyberpunk tram system, luckily you can download a mod for the game that finishes the scrapped train system. Mr. Blue Eyes Mr. Blue Eyes is by far the most mysterious character in the game. He appears a handful of times in the game. However, nobody knows what organization he works for. Nobody even knows his name. And even when he does show up in the game, it's usually pretty weird. For example, he knows about V's problem with Silverhand's Engram, despite V never having met him before. He's even seen watching V from afar. His most notable appearance is during one of the game's endings, where he gives V a pretty special job. That being infiltrating the Crystal Palace, a space station. So who is he? Well, there's three different theories. The first one is mentioned in-game by Gary the Prophet. He claims that blue-eyed people are living in space and coming down to Earth to control the world's governments. This is extremely notable because Mr. Blue Eyes is part of the secret organization that's secretly monitoring and influencing Elizabeth and Jefferson Perilas. The second theory is a lot more believable, though. That being that he's just part of some kind of Illuminati-style elite group. And finally, there's the theory that Mr. Blue Eyes is actually Morgan Blackhand. Now that's quite the bold claim. So what's the evidence for this? Well, there's only one piece of evidence pointing towards this theory, and it's in the game's files. As there, Mr. Blue Eyes is labeled as Morgan Blackhand. While Morgan Blackhand isn't in the game, he is mentioned, as during a news report, you can hear about a shootout in Japantown between some Lazarus agents and a portly man with a black cyber arm, in obvious reference to Blackhand. So if he's out doing that, how can he be Mr. Blue Eyes? We found the front-wheel drive cars America wants at the new, expanded, reliable men of Olds. Ferenz. Oldsmobile's new front-wheel drive sizzles with fuel efficiency. Discounted now. Cutlass Sierra. The appeal of Cutlass. The ease of front-wheel drive. Discounted now. Omega. Restyle. Lumia. Front-wheel drive excitement. Discounted now. Bigger discounts plus GM cash bonuses. Up to $750 now. now at the reliable men of Olds. John Buttkicker Aronson. Underneath the pier in Coast View, you can find the dead body of a man named John Aronson. This dude was trying to fight crime as the superhero Buttkicker. Armed with his trusty batons, he failed. As, I mean, I just mentioned, you can find him dead underneath a pier. You can even find a shard next to him that details how he became obsessed with fighting crime and refused to listen to reason. Butt Kicker here is actually a reference to the Kick-Ass franchise, which consists of four different comic series, two films, and two video games that I don't think anyone remembers. Or wants to remember for that matter. Lucy Avenger Endgames Herself So here's a sad one. This is a theory about the ending of Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Many people believe that Lucy commits Task Force X Yourself almost immediately after the show ends, while she's on the moon. There's not a ton of evidence for this theory, though, with the main piece of evidence being that Lucy looks really depressed at the ending of the show. Since not only is the love of her life dead, and most of her friends are dead, but nearly all of them died saving her. Also, one of her closest friends betrayed her, so there's that too. Personally, I actually believe this theory, but I think her fate is left vague on purpose in case CD Projekt Red wants to use her in Project Orion or another cyberpunk game project. Now with the 2.0 update, there are now memorials for David, Rebecca, and everyone else that died during the events of the show. 
Some people have claimed that this is evidence that Lucy returned to Earth and set all of these up, but I, I'm not convinced. She could have easily asked Falco to do it. After all, Falco was the one who had David's jacket, not Lucy. CJ in Big Smoke in the game, you can find a shard titled JC and Little Smoke by a train tunnel in Red Peaks. This shard tells the final moments of JC and Little Smoke, as the pair are trying to follow a train, only for another train to come by and smash into them. This is a very obvious reference to the characters CJ and Big Smoke from Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. As not only are their names similar, but in that game, there's a mission where you gotta follow a train. The final line of the shard is even a direct reference to Big Smoke's line in the game, if the player fails to follow the train. 6000 Sucks At first glance, the Archer Hella ECD i360 may just look like your standard car. And uh, that's because it is, it's just a standard car. But it's also a reference to the Robocop franchise, as its design is heavily inspired by the 6000 Sucks, a car from the Robocop franchise that's meant to make fun of the real-life car, the Pontiac 6000. I'm not even remotely a car guy though, so I have no idea if the Pontiac sucks, I just, I don't know, the film thinks it does. The Trekkies So if you thought the Bozos were the weirdest gang in Night City, think again. Meets the Trekkies, a gang that roleplays as characters from the original Star Trek series. While normally they're pretty well behaved, they don't have any issue fighting. And they're actually fairly good at it, with members of the Trekkies having access to some crazy technology, including microwave guns and infrared scanners. A good amount of their members are also enhanced via cybernetics and nanotech. Some of them even had surgery and cybernetic enhancements to look more like aliens from the series, like the Vulcans, and even the Borgs, who weren't even in the original series. Their main base is designed internally to look like a Star Trek starship, and even has various laser turrets protecting it. So at first glance, while they may look like a bunch of Star Trek LARPers, they're not to be messed with. As for whether or not the Trekkies are still around in 2077, I doubt it. And if they are around, we don't see them in the game because of real-world issues. Because I don't think Star Trek would be happy if there was a game out there where you could brutally kill people dressed up like Captain Kirk and Spock. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull got somebody killed. In Red Peaks, you could find a dead body inside of a refrigerator. The body's got a shard on him, and if you read it, you'll discover that this dude was a bit of a mythbuster. He had a show where he busted famous myths. And one day, one of his viewers sent him a request to see if he could survive a massive explosion while hiding inside of a fridge. This is a very obvious reference to the scene from Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, where Indiana Jones survives a nuke by hiding in a refrigerator. So this guy decides to take up the viewer's request and test out the myth. He even put on a fedora to match Indiana Jones. So. Can you survive a giant explosion while hiding inside of a fridge? No. Myth busted. Bridge, baby. During the job, The Hunt, you can find a weird capsule inside of the Night City Police Department. This capsule is filled with a strange orange liquid and a human infant. It's just sitting there in the police lab. If you go up and scan it, you can find out that the baby, known as the BB, is actually alive, and is being kept alive in this container, as this device was created to simulate conditions inside the uterus. It also detects BTs. This is a reference to the video game Death Stranding, as in that game, there's bridge babies, fetuses being kept alive inside containers, just like this one, that are used to detect monsters known as the beached things. Now does this mean, in the cyberpunk universe, the beached things exist? No, probably not, it's just an easter egg. Kiwi's Hyena I was going to talk about this in the Edge Runner Designs entry, but I thought it deserved its own entry. Anyways, early designs for Kiwi had her wearing a trench coat and a really big hat. But the most interesting thing about her is that Kiwi was originally going to have a pet hyena. 
Now, the official word from Studio Trigger is that this creature is actually a cyber dog. But it looks identical to a hyena, so I guess maybe it's a cyber dog modeled to look like a hyena? But wouldn't that just make it a cyber hyena? Regardless, this dude did not show up in the anime, and I don't think it's actually canon. Hey, remember in Modern Warfare 3, where in the levels set in Africa, you fought against guard hyenas instead of guard dogs? Very weird. Golden God 215 During the mission, Space Oddity, you can find a laptop which you can hack. If you do so, you'll find a message from the dating site, Night City Dating. The website is letting whoever owns this laptop know, know that they're banned from the site. After it was discovered, they were sending explicit images to users without their consent. And their account name is GoldenGod215. This is a reference to the series It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, as in that show, one of the main characters, Dennis, refers to himself as a Golden God several times on the show. He's also probably a serial killer, and a sex criminal. And if you're not convinced that this is an Always Sunny Easter Egg, 215 is the area code for Philadelphia. So it's undoubtedly an Always Sunny reference. Pineapple on pizza is illegal. In Cyberpunk 2077, you can scan various NPCs and see if they're wanted for anything. They could be wanted for killing someone, stealing something, kidnapping someone, arson, putting pineapple on pizza, threatening somebody, stalking somebody, being part of a gang, gang violence, etc. There's a ton of violent crimes happening in Night City. Wait a second, murder, stealing, kidnapping, arson, pineapple on pizza? That's illegal? As a reference to the real-world debate, about whether or not pineapple on pizza is good or not, in 2077, Night City has made it illegal to put pineapple on pizza, as doing so violates the Pizza Desecration Act. So next time you're playing Cyberpunk 2077, and you eat a tofu tuna and pineapple pizza, just know you're committing a crime. Keanu Reeves exists inside Cyberpunk. In the song, No Save Point, which was created for the game, Keanu Reeves is mentioned by name. This suggests that at some point in the cyberpunk universe, Keanu Reeves existed. This was later confirmed by Patrick Mills, who served as the game's senior quest designer. He stated that Keanu Reeves did exist in the cyberpunk universe, and was a collapse-era actor. And because of how similar looking Silverhand and Keanu Reeves are, after Johnny died, people would mistake Keanu Reeves for being Johnny Silverhand. Now, it's unknown how big of an actor Keanu Reeves was in the world of cyberpunk, but he must have not have been as famous as Johnny Silverhand. Joanne McLean During the mission, following the river, when V and River are playing with River's niece and nephew, his niece is playing as the character Joanne McLean, who is a police officer. This is a very obvious reference to John McLean, the main character of the Die Hard franchise. This isn't the only Die Hard reference in the game. You can find a shard on top of a building in downtown Center City that tells the story of a dude named John McBain going after some guy named Hans via entering the building's air vents. He also says, uh, yippee ki -yay. John McBain is an obvious reference to John McClane, and this entire shard is a reference to the scene in the first Die Hard movie where McClane travels through some air vents. He also says, yippee ki -yay in the movie. Also, the villain of the first Die Hard movie is named Hans. Sherlock Holmes In the game, you can find a shard detailing a conversation between a man named John Doyle and Arthur Baker. Doyle is trying really hard to impress Baker with his detective skills, but Baker isn't convinced, especially after Doyle mentions that he drugged a woman who was part of a gang. You can find this shard next to two dead bodies near a buck -a slice shop in Hennywood. So that woman and her friends probably came back for revenge and killed them? Now at first glance, 
this just seems like a little story. But in actuality, this is a reference to Sherlock Holmes, as the name John Doyle and Arthur Baker are taken from the name of Sherlock Holmes' creator, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the character John Watson, and Sherlock Holmes' in-universe address, 221B Baker Street. Spontaneous Dental Hydroplosion In the game, you can find a shard titled Chemicals, the Invisible Killer. This is a PSA-like shard that tells people about the dangers of chems and how it can lead to not just addiction, but also diseases. One of these diseases is known as spontaneous dental hydroplosion. This is a disease that leads to your teeth being liquefied and dripping down your throat. Now, obviously, this isn't a disease in the real world. But CD Projekt Red didn't come up with this fake disease. This is a reference to The Office. In that show, it's a fake disease created in the Season 1 episode, Healthcare. But unlike The Office, spontaneous dental hydroplosion is a real disease in the world of cyberpunk. Probably. Joshua Stephenson was right. So Joshua Stephenson is one of the game's weirdest characters. He's a murderer with a messiah complex, and eventually convinces various people that he's actually talked to God. After finding God, he went on various talk shows to spread his message about forgiveness and religion. Wanting to take advantage of his newly found fame, a woman named Rachel approached him and offered him a chance of a lifetime. Instead of serving out his prison sentence, he'd be crucified and his crucifixion would be recorded into a brain dance. And Joshua accepted. This is where V comes in, as they're asked by Joshua to stay by his side and eventually be the one to crucify him. It's a really weird series of missions. But these missions have led to the theory that Joshua Stephenson wasn't just some crazy murderer, but instead was telling the truth. He really did talk to God, in that the message he was spreading was in fact God's message. So is there any evidence to this theory? There's only two pieces of evidence, and even then, they're barely evidence. The first is that the name Joshua is the direct English transliteration of the Hebrew name Yeshua, which is a name for Jesus. And during the job, there is a light that never goes out, you eat at pies with Joshua, Rachel, and nine other people. And including V, that makes twelve. Just like how twelve people attended the Last Supper. But regardless of this evidence, he could have been right. Or wrong. It's really up to the players to decide, as I doubt we'll ever get any official confirmation. The Batmobile. The mission, Merkman Returns Again Once More Forever, is a direct reference to Batman. The job has you travel to a hideout in an old abandoned tunnel. The hideout is inside of a shipping container, and in the hideout, there's a black Rayfield Caliburn alongside a shard. The shard tells the story of a man who made that hideout his home. When he was a kid, he was orphaned after his parents were murdered. So he decided to become a vigilante and fight crime in Night City as the superhero Merkman. However, in the shard, Merkman also mentions how he'll fight crime until the day he dies. And uh, since this hideout is seemingly abandoned, there's a pretty good chance that Merkman is dead. Kinda hope he's dead, actually, because uh, V just straight up steals the Merkmobile. So if he's not dead, he's gonna come after V. Gendo Akari. So here's an extremely minor Easter egg that I'm only including in this video because I did an entire iceberg about the series it's related to. The image used for the perk, Head Start, is directly based on Gendo Akari, and his iconic pose from the anime series Neon Genesis Evangelion. Want to know some more about Evangelion? Go check out that video. It's one of my favorites. Machiko and Atom Smasher banged. So you know Atom Smasher? 
the giant cyborg monster man who's really badass in edge runners and the lore but in the game he's a, a pretty easy boss fight yeah well it turns out that atom smasher has smashed before now who would want to smash atom smasher well we know the answer michiko or Asaka. no really around the mid 2020s Right after turning 18, Michiko began dating Atom Smasher. Now at the time, Atom Smasher wasn't the full-on cyborg we see in the game. He still had some human parts of him left. In fact, while they were dating, Atom Smasher had his mind inside of a different body that sounded like Elvis Presley. But yeah, uh, they banged. Or smashed. Carrie's Laptop Foreshadows His Romance if you look on Carrie's laptop, you can find two different songs, one called Dark Matter and the other one Shivers. These two songs foreshadow quest lines involving Carrie, with the first song, Dark Matter, sharing the name of the club V and Carrie visit in the mission Off the Leash. And Shivers references the Path of Glory ending to the game, which is often considered the best ending for Carrie's romance. Platform 69 3 fourths. So when Cyberpunk 2077 released, there was a bug in the game that made it so that NPCs would walk through a wall near the Wellsprings pumping station fast travel point. And so, when the developers went to go fix the glitch, they left behind some graffiti reading Platform 69 and 3 fourths. This is in reference to how in the Harry Potter franchise, wizards travel to platform 93 fourths and walk through a wall in a train station to enter the wizarding world. Tears in Rain So there's two different easter eggs referencing the iconic Tears in Rain monologue from the film Blade Runner. The first is on top of the Advocent Hotel. If you take the elevator inside and travel to the roof, the game will change to night regardless of whatever time it is and it'll start to rain. Exploring the rooftop will eventually lead to a dead man sitting upright holding a bird. Just like how in Blade Runner, a bird is seen flying as Roy Batty passes away. The second easter egg is more of a tribute, as you can find the line, All of these moments we lost in time, like tears and rain, on a plaque in the memorial site alongside an image of a dove. This is in reference to how in 2019, Rutger Hauer, the actor who played Roy Batty, passed away. Wall running. Originally, Cyberpunk 2077 was going to allow players to wall run around Night City, like they're playing Titanfall or Black Ops 3. You could even stop in mid-run with Mantis Blades and hang on to the wall. You can even see this ability in action in a few gameplay trailers. However, sadly, in July of 2020, CD Projekt Red confirmed that the wall running ability would be cut from the game due to design reasons. T-Bug faked her death. T-Bug is a supporting character in the first act of 2077 and was seen pretty heavily in the game's early marketing, showing up in various trailers and gameplay previews. Despite her prominence, she's killed off screen during the heist job getting her brain fried by Soul Killer. Now, some people have claimed that T-Bug actually faked her death once she saw the job was going wrong. This is due to two reasons. The first is that prior to the mission, she tells Jackie that she wants a fresh start in a clean slate after the heist job. And she's also friends with Dex, so it's entirely possible that after the job went bad, Dex just let her go. So I'm not sure. It's entirely possible that T-Bug is still alive, and it's entirely possible that T-Bug is dead. Maybe we'll find out the answer in a future cyberpunk project. They said it was just gonna be an easy grab. Well, it ain't no easy grab, they got T. Charlize Fury. In the Biotechnia Flats, you can find a crashed truck with various bodies surrounding it. Alongside the dead, there's a shard. This shard reveals that two of the people inside the truck were named Charlize Fury and Max, and they were escorting various pregnant women out of Night City while being chased by Biotechnia. A woman named Dakota Smith was on the phone with Charlize and told her that if she had to, 
ditch everyone but one of the mothers. This is all a reference to the film Mad Max Fury Road. As in that film, a dude named Max helps a woman named Furiosa escort various pregnant women to freedom in a high-speed car chase. Also, Furiosa is played by Charlize Theron. Sadly, unlike the film, there's no happy ending here, as the bodies surrounding the truck are all based on the characters from the film, with one of them looking like Max and another one looking like Furiosa so it's very likely that Charlie's Fury and Max failed. The Elvises. So you know the Kings from New Vegas? Yeah, the Elvises are kind of like that. They're a gang obsessed with Elvis Presley that was prominent from the 2000s to the 2020s. They actually seized Graceland, Elvis Presley's real-life home by force in 2008, and used it as their headquarters. Led by the mysterious The King, the group began setting up Elvis chapels across the entire world. So nobody's safe from the Elvis Presley cult. They're so obsessed with the dude that every single member dresses up like Elvis during a different period of his life. With some people dressing up as young Elvis, while some dress up as old Elvis. There's probably somebody in the group even dressed up like baby Elvis or soldier Elvis. Last thing that I'll mention is that they claim to have concrete evidence that Elvis died in 2002, not 1977. However, they've never actually shared that evidence with anyone, so they're probably lying. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. During the mission, The Prophet's Song, you're asked by Johnny, who are you betting on showing up? And V can respond with a Monty Python reference. On showing up. The reptilians or techno necromancers? The Spanish Inquisition. I admit, I didn't expect that. This is a really minor one, but I thought it was funny, so I included it. Not because the reference is funny, but because V's delivery of it just feels kind of odd to me. Ozob Bozo. So, Ozob Bozo is a weird character in that he originates not from CD Projekt Red or Mike Pondsmith. Instead, Ozob was created by the co-founder of the Brazilian website Jovum Nerd, Dave Pazos. This character was created in the 1990s and would appear in a few cyberpunk RPG podcasts. This led to Ozob receiving quite the fan base over the years. And so, when making Cyberpunk 2077, CD Projekt Red decided to introduce the character to even more people. What's even cooler is that Pazos actually voices Ozob in the Brazilian-Portuguese dub of Cyberpunk 2077, and ad-libbed nearly all of his lines. He was even offered by CD Projekt Red to voice him in the English version of the game, but he declined the offer saying that a professional voice actor would be better due to his very strong accent. Now, is Ozob related to the Bozos? No. While at first glance he may seem like he is, since he looks like a clown, he's not actually part of the gang. Instead, he's just a mercenary from Brazil. <laughs> Price. The new Dodge Shadow is going to cast a giant shadow across America. Dodge setting new standards of performance. Arnold Blake. Arnold Blake is the name of a combat robot wearing sunglasses you could find dead in Santo Domingo's canal system, alongside its dead body, you could find a dead guy, 
two motorcycles, and a truck. There's also a data shard you can read. If you read it, you'll learn that Arnold Blake was sent to protect a man named Jimmy O'Connor. However, this mission ended in failure, as both Arnold and Jimmy were killed by another robot that was sent by somebody wanting O'Connor dead. This entire scene is a reference to the film Terminator 2 Judgment Day, specifically the scene in which the T-800, alongside John Connor, are chased by the T-1000 in a tow truck through a canal. Moscow Mule when Jackie and V first visit the Afterlife Bar, Jackie gives Claire a drink recipe that eventually becomes the drink, the Jackie Wells. While some players might think they created this drink for the game, in actuality, the drink that Jackie describes is identical to the real-world drink, the Moscow Mule. I like to think that in in-universe, Jackie knew this and was just hoping that nobody in Night City knew about the Moscow Mule. The Arasaka's Plot So a lot of people incorrectly say that Cyberpunk 2077 is the first game in the Cyberpunk franchise. This isn't true. The first Cyberpunk video game was released in 2007 for mobile devices. Developed by Mayhem Studio, Cyberpunk The Arasaka's Plot was a platformer about a man named Sam Gibson in the year 2022 being on the run after being framed for murder by Arasaka. The game allowed players to fight enemies via guns or melee weapons, pick up and use armor and cybernetic implants, and even hack various objects. Thankfully, the game has been archived, so if you know how to download and play Java games, you can play this long-forgotten piece of cyberpunk history. A Perfect Day for a Jungle Cruise so this is another Ghost in the Shell reference. In fact, it's actually a reference to my favorite episode in Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex. That being the Season 1 episode, A Perfect Day for a Jungle Cruise. In the game, you can find a shard that tells the story of a veteran who is turned into a serial killer, torturing and killing people while believing that he's actually on a covert operation in the jungles of South America. This is nearly identical to the plotline of the episode that I just mentioned. Side note, the bad guy in that episode is dressed like a minion. Maine's fine. So the United States of America is in a bit of a dystopia during the events of Cyberpunk 2077, with each state having its own major cyberpunk-style issues and problems. That is, except for Maine. No, not, not that Maine. That Maine's dead. For some reason, the state of Maine has been relatively the same since the 2020s. Not saying it's perfect there, it, it's not. For example, there's some EU fishing ships that are causing the local fishermen there some problems. But yeah, that's really it. There's not really any cybercrime or gang activity in Maine. There's no black markets, no cyber psychos, etc. It's just relatively chill there. At least compared to the rest of the country. Faye Spiegel, Spike Valentine, and Jet White. In Rancho Coronado, it's possible to find a computer listing the name of five NPCs. Faye Spiegel, Spike Valentine, Jet White, Vicious Velaju, and Electra Ovirova. This is a very obvious reference to the anime Cowboy Bebop as the show's main characters are named Spike Spiegel, Faye Valentine, and Jet Black. While the other two names are references to the show's main antagonist, Vicious, and the character Electra from the Cowboy Bebop film, Samuel Morton. In the Biotechnia Protein Farms, you can find a shard held by a dead man named Samuel Morton. This shard reveals that Morton was a former combat medic smuggling people from the moon to Earth. This, alongside bailing from his post, caught him some attention from Militech, who wanted to arrest him. So after being exposed, Samuel fled to Night City and began a career as a protein farmer. Sadly for him, though, somebody found him and killed him. Samuel here is a reference to the character Sapper Morton from Blade Runner 2049, as not only was Sapper also a combat medic, but they also share the exact same birthday and both of them went into hiding as protein farmers. They even have very similar ID numbers. 
with Samuels being NA680515 and Sappers being NK680514. And sadly, both of their stories end the same way, being killed in their homes. Flathead Drone Companion During the job, the pickup, you grab a Militech MT-0D-12 drone, aka a Flathead drone. Originally, this drone was going to be a companion for V, fighting alongside them during jobs, and even having the ability to hack enemies and devices. You'd even be able to issue direct commands to the bot. However, this was cut during development. It would have been part of the Techie skill tree, which was also cut from the game. The Techie skill tree was cut because it apparently had too many overlapping abilities with the Netrunner skill tree. So CD Projekt Red simply combined the two trees. And sadly, like the Gambit movie, the Flathead drone didn't survive the merge. Atom Smasher knew V was in the room. So this is a theory that Atom Smasher actually knew that V and Jackie were in the room where Yorinobu killed his father. Now, why do people think this? Well, probably because Atom Smasher is looking straight at V, not even moving, making eye contact with him. The theory goes that Smasher knows they're in the room, but instead of telling somebody about it immediately, he just wants to mess with V and Jackie. It's an interesting theory, but I highly doubt this was the intention. Children of Men Near the sunken boat on the beach by the Grand Imperial Mall, you could find a shard inside of a bag that tells the story of a man named Theo Farron smuggling a woman and her child out of Night City. He's doing this for a group called the Human Project, who really want the kid alive. Turns out that Arasaka is planning something for the girl. It's not said what it is, but it can't be good. Luckily, Theo's able to get the mother and child out of Night City. However, he's not so lucky and is fatally injured. And in his final moments, he tells the Human Project that the kid is a living wonder. This shard is a reference to the film Children of Men, as the plot of that film is about a man named Theo escorting a woman and her daughter out of a dystopian UK. Car customization. Despite a bunch of open-world games having the option to customize vehicles, like Grand Theft Auto and even Far Cry, CD Projekt Red scrapped the ability to customize your cars, trucks, and motorcycles by June 2020. It was removed from the game because of time restraints placed on the dev team. Edge Runners Alternate Endings at the 2023 Paris Anime Expo, executive producers for Edge Runners revealed that there were two other endings to the show that were considered. The first ending would have had David surviving his encounter with Atom Smasher. However, he'd be brainwashed by Arasaka and turned into a war machine like Atom Smasher. This ending was scrapped because it was deemed too bleak, and the writers didn't find it a very satisfying ending. The other ending was going to have Lucy discovering that she's pregnant with David's kid while on the moon after David dies. This was scrapped because it was deemed too uplifting of an ending. Version Zero In July of 2021, YouTuber Tyler McVicker released a video detailing how anyone with a physical version of the PS4 or Xbox One port of Cyberpunk 2077 can access and play an early build to the game. All you gotta do is install the game on your console and don't let the console update it, including the day one patch. This version of the game is known as version zero. This version is dated September of 2020, so about three months before the game was released. In this build of the game, you can find various things that were cut from the final release, and some things that were cut and put back into the game in future patches and ports of the game. For example, traveling vendors, icons for missions called Special Delivery, various different silencers for weapons, the ability to buy things from street vendors, the ability to collect ammo from dead bodies by just walking over them, etc. The game is also extremely unstable and glitchy, but you can play it. No idea why this version of the game is on the disc, but it is. 
Thomas Starr. In the Badlands, you can find a shard inside of a cave. And the shard isn't alone, as it's surrounded by various dead wraiths. Upon reading the shard, you'll learn that a man named Thomas Starr killed all of them. See, it turns out that Thomas Starr was a Militech engineer, and the wraiths kidnapped him so they could force him to create missile launchers. However, Thomas Starr had a very different idea, and secretly created an iron exoskeleton equipped with flamethrowers. And with this iron exoskeleton, he easily killed all of the wraiths and escaped. This is a very obvious reference to Iron Man, specifically the MCU version of the character, as Tony Stark pretty much goes through the exact same situation, even equipping his Mark I Iron Man armor with the same weapons. Atom Smasher's Demon Skull In Cyberpunk 2077, Atom Smasher is shown to have a relatively human-looking head. It's robotic and all messed up, but it's still like humanoid. Even in a lot of the source books, he's shown to have a robotic humanoid face. But then, in Edge Runners, Atom Smasher straight up has the skull of a demon. Now, in reality, it's more than likely that Atom Smasher's demon skull was just an artistic choice by Studio Trigger to help convey stuff about the character. Basically, showing that Atom Smasher is more monster than man. I don't think in the actual lore he has, like, a demon skull. Cancelled Google Stadia Phantom Liberty port. So most people know that Cyberpunk 2077 was released for the PS4, PC, Xbox One, PS5, and Xbox Series XS. However, not as many people know that it was also released for the Google Stadia in December of 2020. Now this Google Stadia version was easily the least popular of all the versions of the game. But it still had a player base. A very small player base, but hey, they existed. Probably. And unlike the PS4 and Xbox One versions of the game, the Stadia version was supposed to get the Phantom Liberty DLC in 2023. And it probably would have gotten that DLC if the Google Stadia didn't die in January of 2023. So the Stadia port of Phantom Liberty, which was already being worked on, had to be cancelled because it literally couldn't be released. In fact, you can't play the Google Stadia port of Cyberpunk 2077 anymore. It's impossible. How People Really Become Cyber Psychos So there's a misconception about Cyber Psychos. The cybernetic implants are not the cause of the condition. Instead, it's a combination between the cybernetic implants, the stress of living in a dystopian cyberpunk world, the individual's ability to relate with people, and whether or not they're able to balance their worldview through other methods. This was revealed on Reddit by the man himself, Mike Pondsmith, where he used David Martinez and V as examples of how people can avoid becoming cyberpsychos. David had a loving mother and a career path, and eventually found a found family and a girlfriend. That's how he was able to avoid going cyberpsycho, at least for the most part. And as for V, they had Johnny in their brain, so he probably acted like a buffer for the psychological hits V takes throughout the game. It also helps that V was friends with various people, like Vic, Jackie, Pan Am, Misty, Carrie, River, Rogue, Claire, etc. David Bowie was going to play Johnny Silverhand. So this is a bit messed up. It's a well-known fact that Mike Pondsmith modeled Johnny Silverhand off of David Bowie. Though there were other inspirations, like Brian Adams, but Bowie was always the main one. This is really obvious if you look at Silverhand's original designs from the source books. And so, when the studio decided on having Silverhand in the game, the obvious choice to play the character was David Bowie. However, David Bowie passed away in 2016. But this wasn't going to stop CD Projekt Red. As revealed in an interview in 2020, quote, at one point, we even toyed with the idea of taking and reviving a recently deceased longtime luminary of the recording industry. 
Now some might say it was a pipe dream to assume that we could do that, technologically or otherwise. Well, I'll see you that pipe dream and raise you another. One could easily say that it was a pipe dream to assume we could successfully pitch to and ultimately enlist Keanu Reeves to play the role. This most likely meant that CD Projekt Red were experimenting using AI to replicate his voice, or have Johnny look like David Bowie, but have somebody else voicing him. Coneheads. So if you thought the Bozos, the Trekkies, and the Elvises were weird, wait until you meet the Coneheads. This was a gang in Night City in the 2020s that went around with classic sci-fi inspired weapons. They also had their heads surgically and cybernetically enhanced to make them look like the Coneheads, a reoccurring sketch from Saturday Night Live in the 1990s that went on to have a film that I don't think anyone is a fan of. They also speak just like the characters from the sketches, very robotic. And uh, that's all we know about them. They, uh, they probably didn't last very long. Vampires exist in cyberpunk. So vampires exist in the world of cyberpunk, but they're not like the vampires of myth or film. Instead, they're just lunatics who get cyberware implants for their mouths. These implants basically give you vampire fangs, though you can also get your entire mouth filled with them. It's called the Shark Grin Special, and with these teeth, you can go around and bite people. You can also get these teeth augmented with poison injectors, so you can go even further into the vampire lifestyle, though I don't think there's any enhancement that lets you suck blood. I should also mention this. There is an alternate universe series of source books for Cyberpunk 2020 called Night's Edge. That is all about vampires, werewolves, and vampire hunters. These source books were created by the Canadian company, Giannis. Keep in mind though, these aren't canon in the slightest. Cyberpunk version 3.0. Cyberpunk version 3.0 is a bit of a controversial entry to the Cyberpunk franchise. Released in 2005, 3.0 was heavily criticized by fans for a fairly dramatic change in setting and tone. Also, people weren't super into the dolls. Yeah, instead of drawings, Mike Pondsmith used various images of dolls. And, uh, look, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of something nice to say, uh, um, they're unique. There's also some really weird lore stuff that people weren't really big on, like how amusement parks had various mechas, Night City being made of living gray goo nano machines, and net running, creating physical objects to appear in the real world. Despite the release of two source books, Beyond the Edge, Alt Cult Insider Issue 1, and Gang Book, Mike Pondsmith would announce that version 3.0 was no longer considered canon. The 2013 Build of 2077 In June 2021, pre-alpha footage of Cyberpunk 2077 was leaked online. Unlike version 0, which was dated only three months before the release of the game, this build of the game came from 2013, a full seven years prior. The gameplay shows a male V in third person exploring an apartment. He's hanging out with a woman named Sandra, whose husband was recently killed. He's also got a buddy named Pat, who's digging around the net for information about Sandra. V could interact with a ton of different things in the apartment, like a breakfast machine. There's even nudity in this build of the game. While this is all pretty interesting, this build was most likely made for testing purposes, as this looks to be extremely early on in the game's development. I am not me. In Rocky Ridge, you can find a small shack inside of a wraith's camp. By doing a crouch jump, you can enter the shack, and inside, you'll be met with some weird artwork. There's a drawing of a child with black eyes, looking almost like an early 2010s creepypasta. There's also a drawing of what looks to be a face gouged out, 
and a scarecrow-like character with its face scribbled out, almost looking like a city skyline. Finally, there's a phrase written out on the wall. I am not me. It's a pretty disturbing discovery, and for a while, nobody really knew why this was here. It wasn't a reference to anything, and it had no plot relevance. Was it really just some weird horror easter egg? Well, the answer can actually be found in the mission Disaster Piece. While you're trying to rescue Evelyn, you can find similar graffiti painted on various walls. This has led some people to theorize that these pieces of art are created by people who are addicted to some kind of chem, or this is the beginning of somebody becoming a cyberpsycho, or even somebody who has witnessed way too many brain dances. There's also other rooms throughout the game where you can see this message, I am not me, some of which you can only access if you no clip. All right, and that's it. That's the uh, Cyber Cyberpunk uh, 2077 Iceberg. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this one. Uh, it's a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like uh, like the dead, uh, dead, uh, dead Space Iceberg length, but uh, here we are, like an hour and 40. Like I said, hope you enjoyed. Uh, this is released uh, releasing uh, right uh, right before Phantom Liberty, so that should be uh, pretty cool. You know, I, I'm looking forward to Phantom Liberty. Apparently, it's gotten really good reviews. Uh, watch them introduce some of the unused areas that I mentioned in this video in that DLC, like the resorts and stuff like that. My luck, that's going to happen, and then I'll get like a million comments about it, but oh well. Oh well, it is what it is. So uh, in the comments below, I mean, tell me who's your favorite character is. Uh, what's your favorite entry in the iceberg? Uh, your favorite piece of lore? Uh, and of course, if I got anything wrong, uh, let me know, and I'll correct it in like a pinned uh, comment. Uh... But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. It, it was a fun time. Uh, next month will be a horror-themed iceberg. Uh, not like cryptozoology or like aliens and stuff like that. Well, <laughs> aliens, but not not the uh, the one I did last year, like aliens and UFOs. Uh, a little hint there for next month. But yeah, uh, after that, then uh, we'll see about November. But December, we'll definitely have an iceberg as well. Uh, no promises in November. I'm going to hope I mean, I'm, I'm gonna try to get one out in november as well but we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens that's all i'll say uh yeah hope you guys enjoyed i said like 10 times by now but uh yep have a good one guys stay safe and have a good one we just see we won first place hey you sound surprised first place it's not that i'm surprised it's just i know first place i heard you Let's hold up at the finish line a minute, just in case. You got it.